So today what we're going to do is we're going to do, um, this is a two-part session. The first part is a lecture on layouts and grids. Um, and Alex and I have worked together at Diller's Graffiti and Renfro, and now she's at Bloomberg, and her everyday life is dealing with this topic, and she's going to give you more of an introduction to what she does when she comes up to talk. Um, afterwards, I'm going to give a talk for about 40 minutes. Um, it's going to walk you through a workflow in InDesign. So what I do as a professional is I make books um, and other printed media. I'm a graduate of GSAP in 2009 um, and went into publishing and graphic design for architects. Um, I think with this tutorial, everyone who comes and s just absorbs what we have to say, um, they, students always come back and say that it saves them time. Um, I kind of learn something every time I do it, and I think um, everyone in the room has something to learn from it, so it's always a positive experience. Um, today at 2, we have a workshop with um, Ronald Young, who does the um, photography here at the school. He's going to show you how to take professional um, photographs of your models and your work using the equipment in the AV office. He's going to teach you how to use manual settings on an SLR, how to light your models, show examples of good lighting projects. Um, I, and then afterwards, I'm going to give a really quick tutorial on color management. So if you've ever had a black that's printed brown or purple, um, I highly recommend that you come. <laughs> it's just pointers on how to set up your work um, and basically have a proper um, color workflow so when you print your portfolio, you're not stuck in a jam in the last minute. Um, tomorrow, we have two more lectures. At 11 a.m., we have Tom Griffiths, who um, teaches typography at Yale. He's coming to talk to us about type. Um, you're going to walk away from that session um, knowing the history of type, um, knowing how digital type works and how to use it properly. Um, and then you're going to walk away with some good typefaces to use and also the resources to find um, some fonts that might interest you. Um, in the afternoon at 2 p.m., there's going to be a talk by Adam Frampton, who's a studio critic here, and that's going to be on narrative. Um, and basically, that's about editing your portfolio, learning what type of book you want to produce, um, giving your book an attitude, um, and then uh, basically how to stitch your work together. Because I know it's challenging when you have six studios, four visual studies classes, um, like three history and theories. Like, how do you all make sense? How do you make sense of all of it? Um, next weekend, we have one on one workshops with you guys. Um, so basically, I have sign-up sheets that I'm going to put out on this table at the end of every session. Um, we ask a few things. One of them is that please just sign up for one slot to begin with. Um, we have four alumni coming in who have recently graduated from the school. All of them won portfolio awards, so they've done very well. All of them have interesting careers. Um, and I think that they're basically going to sit down with you for 15 minutes. For five minutes, you're going to present your portfolio to them. And then for 10 minutes, they're going to give you feedback. So the idea is, is when you present your portfolio, they're going to assess really whether you're communicating your ideas clearly. And then you guys are going to workshop how to improve it. Um, I think that in these workshops, it's sort of an open forum. So you can come with any questions you may have, any particular advice that you want. Um, it's really for you to use to take your portfolio to the next level and get some help from people who have been through the process. Um, a couple, yeah, well, the things that we ask are, yeah, please in the beginning just sign up for one slot. Um, we also ask everyone who comes to these be a student who has to graduate with a portfolio this year. So that includes third year MRCs, AADs, and urban design students. If you feel like you have to submit a portfolio and you're not in one of those programs, come and talk to me. It's just a capacity issue. We usually get about 140 students who want these one-on-one um, -on -one workshops, and we just can't accommodate everyone. Um, the other thing is, is please bring a printed portfolio to this. Please don't bring your laptop or an idea. But even if you walk away from these sessions and you lay out a spread, just print it and bring it. But whatever you bring, just bring a printed copy. It helps so much to have that on the table to discuss. 
Um, and then the last component of this is, um, well, there are two last components. One is next Sunday on February 7th. Um, some of the recent alums who have won prizes are actually coming to present their portfolios to you. Um, so they have had exceptional portfolios. They're going to give you their insights on their process, how it worked for them, how they put together their portfolio. You're going to be broken into small groups so that you can visit. Basically, it'll be like a round table. So there are four presentations. You'll move around in groups and see each of the portfolios, and it'll be intimate enough that you can actually ask questions to the alums. Um, and then the last component is editing. So Friday, February 12th at 1 p.m. in Ware Lounge, um, there is going to be a lecture um, with small independent architecture publications, and I highly recommend you attend. Um, the editing process, uh, I think the question that I get out of, um, of this program, most of all, is, um, you know, what do I do with all this work? <laughs> I have so much work, I don't know how to organize it in a portfolio. The editing lecture is going to give you insight on how architectural editors take large, like, blocks of work and select what to use and how to stitch it together into an article. So, um, just a word about myself in case you guys don't know me. I graduated here in 2009. Um, I've been running this program for seven years. It gets a little bit bigger and a little bit more improved every year. Um, when we improve it, we improve it from the feedback that we get from you guys. So positive or negative, um, please let us know your thoughts. Reach out to Danielle. You can reach out to me. Um, but it really helps us shape the next year. Um, I publish books. I worked for Dillard and Scofidio and Renfro um, for four and a half years. I did the Lincoln Center book. I designed the Highline book and some art books for them. Um, and now I have my own practice. Um, I work a lot with Harvard on their exhibitions and their print materials, some other um, cultural institutions. Um, I do some stuff for Columbia. Um, and I'm part of New Inc., the incubator down at the New Museum. So um, let me unlock this computer and <laughs> let Alex take the stage. So as Forrest said, uh, we worked together at Diller's Video and Renfro a while back. I was there for three and a half years doing print design, um, mainly for competition boards and books and sometimes project phase books and kind of things along those lines. Uh, and working really with project teams and managers or competition teams and managers. Um, storyboarding out those books or boards um, and then, you know, getting all those different assets, pieces of writing, um, images from all the folks on the team who were working to create those things. Um, and then getting them to print and kind of facilitating the actual te technical part of that, um, always on uh, an impossible deadline. That is, that would be my the main like way to describe that. Um, hey Alex, yeah. Can you speak a little bit closer oh. To the mic or yeah. Let me. Is that better? All right. Let me sit down. I'll be closer to the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, other publications I've worked at are Art in America uh, and the New York Observer. That was all sort of. Well, no, not all. Um, but my graduate school experience was at Carnegie Mellon, where I also um, did some teaching, and uh, that's where I sort of headed on the path where I am today, which is human-computer interaction and information design uh, at Bloomberg. Also have done that um, at Samsung and various other places. Um, and. I mean, I just put on here sort of what I'm going to walk you through today. Um, and this is sort of a very basic intro, I guess, to the evolution and history, function, um, and dysfunction of the grid in layout. And in terms, I guess, uh, the one thing that sort of I was thinking about as I put this together since I've moved really from um, print layout to digital design. Um, you know, for me, the grid is a little bit uh, different in sort of tangible practical ways or in um, how I actually implement it for uh, mobile web, which is where I work. 
Um, but really, the lessons of the grid are pretty constant. Um, the, the notion of just organizing information in a very kind of flexible and extensible system works really well in digital. Um, it's pretty necessary for very high volume, um, very fast kind of work. Um, and I think in just the notion of organizing information or content in some kind of logical way uh, helps me in communicating with um, clients uh, within Bloomberg when businesses come to me and often want a website is what they'll say or they want to refresh their website which usually means we want it to look and feel more current um, but often when we sort of look under the hood of what's going on it's there's very little strategy or thought to how things got to where they were. It tends to be a junk drawer of stuff um, or just a, an evolution of stuff that no longer really makes sense. So a lot of times the grid can help us work quickly in the real design part of the project, but a lot of the heavy lifting is before we even get to the grid, but thinking about going towards the grid, <laughs> um, which is what are the objectives? What are you trying to say? Um, what do users care about? And, um, and how do we organize all of that information? And the grid is really just a way of organizing stuff. Um, so that's my sort of intro and some context. Um, in looking at precedents, uh, really precedents of page layout, um, the very first one that we might look at is um, cuneiform from uh, Mesopotamia. I think this is kind of interesting because one uh, sort of notion that comes up over and over in um, book design is the idea of content and form being really bound together conceptually. Um, here you can see that really content and form are bound together materially and in every other way. It's these sort of pictographs that are created, you know, by kind of stamping them into the wet clay. Um, and, you know, if you think about this as a page, you know, there's really, there is kind of a grid here. There seem to be kind of bands of, um, of uh, these symbols, um, but there's really no, like, margin or edge. It's really edge to edge. Um, so that's just uh, our kind of starting point, which would be 3200 BC. Um, then when we look at uh, a little bit later, 350 AD, we're seeing pages. And um, often these pages that we have today are only one of a what would have been a spread. So that's sort of what I'm indicating. With I think you can see, even with the projection, the sort of there would be a page, right, that mirrors this one. Um, so you can see that there is uh, some thought to the page layout. Um, the writing system has changed to letter forms. Um, and so really the page layout and the letter forms have become a little more abstracted and often the topics have become a little more abstracted. Um, a lot of the, the earliest sort of cuneiform was accounting for um, agricultural goods. Um, so the book now is kind of a container for ideas. Um, yeah. um, here's just an example of, you know, we've gone, there's a, there's a four column text block here. Uh, I guess I did want to add that I think I found that it's really hard when I was putting this presentation together to think about talking about the grid in any way that's separate from talking about image and text, because the grid is just kind of the framework or the binding material for those things. So I know that other people are going to talk to you about images and about typography, um, but I found that there's really, you know, all these things kind of work together in layout, so there's not really any way around. There's way, no way to really avoid talking about, about it. <laughs> um, but hopefully I don't talk about it too much. Um, so here is you know, just another type of layout. There's a single block of text um, with an image. And you know, it's just presented 
big image on top, block of text below. They're sort of separate elements, but they are bound together by this um, margin around, around the page. And a, a contemporary equivalent might be the graphic novel, right? Image, text, or maybe even a children's book. Um, around 800 AG, this is from the Book of Kells, and we see, again, a single block of text, um, but breaking up what could be kind of monotonous, um, just lines of text in a sort of fully justified um, setting. There are these uh, very expressive sort of initial caps, and that kind of breaks up what is, there's not really a grid here, it's kind of a proto-grid, but um, you see that there is that sort of tension between the sort of system of text order and the sort of expression of what's more like an image. Um, and I think in many of these sort of earlier um, manuscript books, the text is sort of the information and often the um, image or embellishment is more a symbol of the status of whomever sort of commissioned this work. Uh, now we're kind of into the maybe early Renaissance, 1485. There's really a strong sense, this is sort of a classically proportioned um, layout with a wider margin at the bottom, um, kind of the narrowest margin in the center and the top. Uh, and I think some of the thinking behind that is that if you're holding a book, you know, you, your hands would be at the bottom of the book if it's, if it's that size book. Um, and also something about the sort of optical weight of that text block. Um, it looks to me like the text block and the page share the same proportions. And that's sort of a um, classical or traditional um, strategy. And here again, we see sort of, a, you know, an implied grid with two columns that's sort of broken by these um, embellished initial caps. Uh, here's four pages from four Gutenberg Bibles, so printable or movable type. Um, so these are all the first page of Genesis. And we can see that the printing is uh, the same, the, the text blocks are the same, and what people would do to sort of customize their Bible would be to um, commission the, the sort of um, decoration or ornamentation in the margins. So we have four different treatments of that. And then you would also, um, it would come unbound and you would commission whatever kind of binding you could sort of afford. Um, here, there's a lot of sort of frames within frames, the sort of architectural device mirroring this um, text block, sort of two windows. And really these wide margins are kind of filled with this floral decoration. And again, kind of same proportions. The text blocks are pretty uh, similar to the page um, dimensions but then these wide margins on the outside have been filled, or almost filled, with uh, these embellishments. And what you can't quite tell from this layout is that the, the sort of decoration on the left is the same if you turned the page. So this leaf had the same decoration front and back, and that leaf had the same kind of decoration front and back. But as a spread, you see two different ones at any one time. And as you flip through, every single leaf has its own decoration. Um, this is another printed book where you can see that here's a leaf. These are both the same page. Um, this leaf before they've applied the printed um, border and printed initial. So here you could kind of like customize um, your book. But really, the, 
the text block kind of stays the same. Um, in this layout, the primary text is that little block in the middle and the commentary is all around it. And you can actually see the sort of guidelines that they've drawn on the page. And this is a primarily informational layout. Uh, this one is kind of interesting and really an outlier. Uh, it, it really is in its own world. Um, it's considered a, an important work of page layout in the Renaissance, um, but it's, it's very unclear what it's even about. It's kind of fantastical and written in many languages, some which maybe are made up. Um, but you see type and image in a much more dynamic relationship and it feels um, in some ways kind of modern. Um, this is a spread where, you know, text is sort of playing the part of an image and, you know, these kind of, I don't know what you call these kind of, it's kind of this banner shape mirroring the actual image of that kind of banner. Um, what's, you know, it's, it's a little more poetic, a little less maybe informational. Uh, this is the rebus spread from the same book where these images you're really meant to read and come up with some meaning. And just another spread from that book. So pretty um, inventive typography and layouts. Um, another type of book would be scientific notebooks, kind of literally experimental. Um, they use that common text block, but with more kind of naturalistic images. Um, some of the interesting things you see here that you would see in modern book design, I think, would be um, images bleeding over the text and over the spine. Um, the plant stalk kind of divides this second column on the left-hand page. You see the text sort of on one side and then on the other. Um, and, and yeah, then, then the plant is kind of um, spanning the whole spread. Um, so really that kind of like defined people's ideas of what book design was um, and page layout was about book layout until maybe the 19th century and newspapers kind of are the new thing on the scene. Um, and that was really enabled by uh, the new printing technology and the industrial revolution. So this is um, uh, an issue of the Times, London in 1815, just a year before they had gotten a printing press capable of making 1,100 impressions per hour. Um, so these were widely circulated in a way that other um, printed materials hadn't been. And you know, they were kind of the equivalent of the time of Times Square in terms of like visual noise. Um, and so I think this was one thing that kind of set the stage for designers or people involved in creating these materials um, or any kind of layout thinking about how to harness the speed and kind of mass output of these new um, mechanized methods of production because it seemed a bit out of control. Um, so just changing gears a tiny bit, influences, um, art, architecture, painting, all these things in the Renaissance governed by formal and aesthetic laws, the notions of proportion, harmony, um, the golden section, uh, in principle, an ideal visual harmony could be created by a rational system. And that's kind of an idea that plays out in the 20th century ideas of the grid. Um, however, in between the Renaissance and the mid 20th century, 
was European avant-garde, kind of before World War I, between the World Wars. Um, we find that these modern art movements are deconstructing the geometry of space, redefining the aesthetics of perspective, and really revolutionized European layout and typography. Um, I think I wrote too much on this slide, but uh, I think in this more, in a, in a painting, um, some of the things that will inform more avant-garde kind of typography um, is this notion of the eye being able to kind of roam. Um, there's not necessarily the same kind of hierarchy, um, maybe has some of the same qualities of a painting or a sculpture. Um, and there's, I think, a tension between thinking about the book as a frame, um, which is kind of what I would call a dumb conduit, um, and the book as a canvas, more like the projection of an artistic intention. So that's kind of the difference in some ways between a newspaper and a painting, two sort of ways to think about presenting ideas and information. So a lot of these artistic influences are, are kind of more expressive. Um, so futurism, space here used as a dynamic component in page layout, it conveys really a specific ethos. Um, futurism is really kind of this radical poetic and political uh, idea. But here you can see content and form kind of bound together. So this is really a landscape made of letters and words. Um, after the Marne, Joffrey visited the front by car. It's kind of a map of someone's travels. Um, here is a book that has kind of a traditional feel, these text blocks, um, but then these kind of images made from type. And again, uh, using sort of collage um, and type, but it's not necessarily conveying information as much as an idea about uh, the world, about um, speed, um, about progress. Um, it's a little more, it's a more poetic uh, object. Uh, this book is kind of interesting. It was bound with bolts, which was, you know, a first. And really kind of looking at the book as a machine uh, made of kind of assembla assemblable and disassemblable parts. Uh, the um, designer who made this, and this was essentially his portfolio, uh, had some like a VIP um, editions uh, where the cover was metal, and those were made for, um, among others, Mussolini and Marinetti, the founder of the Futurist Movement. Um, and then, not to be outdone, Marinetti publishes two books printed entirely on metal sheets, not just the covers, so take that. Um, constructivism, another European avant-garde movement from Russia, um, influencing thoughts around layout, um, typography, image, and space. Here, the page is treated a little bit more like a viewport, um, with a wider spatial field implied. Here, uh, white space is used as much as a form or a field. At, could be a form or a field. Um, here, just some of the devices used, layering transparent type on an axis over this organic photographic imagery. Um, I don't know if you can really see, but there is like graph paper behind the hand that's holding the compass. And there's, you know, a lot of geometric relations between, you know, the angle of the compass and the angle of that black type, um, a lot of careful alignments. And so there's maybe not a grid, but there is the notion of these axes um, and sort of containers. Dadaism, um, 
Here the work is a montage, which was really uh, thinking about the artist as uh, an assembly line worker in some ways. And this is um, kind of playful. This feels a little less playful, but also from Dada movement. Um, a little bit more like machine parts fitting together. There's a lot of guidelines um, appearing as rules. Uh, text really seems to fit into these containers. And there's a notion of, I think, rhythm, where there are some very compressed type, there's some very loose type, and then there are some expansive white spaces. So um, there's really a, a kind of a rhythm there. Um, and some of the devices here, you see the block on the right bleeding off the edge. So there's sort of a text block with some elements breaking out of it. Um, and just as like a reminder, I think when people are designing, um, doing print book design for the first time and um, bleeding images or type off the page, it, I would just say it's important to remember that you can't print to the end of the page, so you will be printing past uh, where your trim lines will be. Um, but consider that when you're laying out your, setting up your pages. Uh, this is another sort of exploration of grid-like containers, and we see the sort of text as image breaking out of that container. <coughs> Here is um, asymmetry and white space, kind of an interlocking effect between type and image. And there's sort of a flow line created by this um, text and type. Dada, you know, really giving tradition a kick in the pants. And I think about playfulness as much as anything. Bauhaus, of course. Um, a state-sponsored school to train artists design and designers. It was uh, an effort to merge craft tradition with modern technology. Um, this is really sort of where um, the grid has some real um, theoretical kind of underpinnings, the notion of uh, rationality and functionality of form, um, a critical approach to design that could be applied to all problems, uh, notions of objectivity and standardization. Um, those are all strong themes in sort of grid systems. Um, color as a grid here, I think we have bands of text with color breaking up the lines. Um, and I stared at this for a while to kind of come up with what was the logic here. And what I came up with was this kind of pattern you know, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, blue. So that bottom line is kind of the um, breaking that pattern of A, B, B, A. Here, type is like literally a grid or a field. Um, color is applied to actually create sort of um, surface the title, not to break it up as, as it does in the previous example. Here's a grid as a device for organizing type, which uh, is very graphic rather than more readable. And this has kind of a staggered layout and all caps, which always fit better in a box than um, sentence case or lowercase. Uh, so that kind of brings us to the Swiss. We can thank the Swiss for the grid. Uh, Jan Tischold, who's not Swiss, he's German, but he does his, uh, he moves to Switzerland in, um, in the 20s, I believe. He leaves Germany. Um, he complains that the Swiss don't know anything about typography, um, but really Swiss design is an international movement. Many um, refugees moved there during the wars and um, and kind of champions a notion of universal design. Uh, Jan Tischold, you should know his name and probably have his book, The New Typography, 
uh, was unlike most graphic designers, and graphic designer was kind of a new word, um, he was not trained in art or architecture. He came from uh, uh, humbler, I guess, beginnings. His father was a sign writer. Um, he was trained in calligraphy, and he's a little bit more of a, a tradesman or craftsman. Um, but he was also deeply informed and inspired by the Bauhaus. Um, so where he was coming from, um, he preferred stock fonts, he, commercial paper stocks, standard paper sizes. Um, he was not interested in a sort of artist book, a custom, custom font, custom book. Um, he really wanted to leverage uh, what was standardized and leverage um, modern publishing technology. He was the first person to kind of codify, or the person that we looked to, there are many people kind of writing these manifestos, um, but he really codified modernist design rules and offered really clear explanations um, on how to use different sizes and weights of type, um, and it was really about communicating information. Oh, and just what these images are actually of. Um, he says these like center aligned, you know, images plopped in the center of these type uh, blocks, text blocks is boring, don't do that. You know, you should have this um, more asymmetrical layout. And in the next spread, he's, he's also saying no to both of these examples, one of which he says, you know, looks like it has some rational logic to it, but then when you kind of examine it, it's really just for an effect. There's no real logic behind that layout. So um, he does not believe in making things just look logical. Uh, and then the example on the right, he uh, criticizes the type for the uh, title, which he says is not very readable. Um, so his kind of rules are um, that the new typography, and really the new typography is like Swiss design or communication design, should be purposeful. The purpose is communication. Communication should be made in the shortest, simplest, clearest way. Uh, and there needs to be an organization of its parts, both in its content and um, in its use of materials. So it's very pragmatic, and this is actually a, a, an image of a magazine that he was, sort of a trade journal that he was an editor of. Uh, and this is just an example of sort of his design. Um, emphasizing elements that reflect the machine age, dynamic energy, implied movement, balance and asymmetry, flush left headlines, underlying grids, um, and really, uh, I would say part of the approach of uh, Swiss design is taking the content or the text itself to inform the design. Uh, another one of his posters. Um, I think what's kind of interesting about this is that it feels like things are sort of sprinkled around the page, but you know, really like every edge of that page has some piece of text like touching it. So it feels like there's a lot of space, um, but every edge is sort of held by, by something structural. Uh, and here are some of his layouts. This is for an exhibition catalog. You can sort of see um, there's a very wide margin on the center and a narrow margin on the outside, which is not sort of the traditional uh, uh, text block layout. Here's another asymmetric page layout where the text blocks are both pushed to the right. Um, and then when we get to, so Jan Tischold is kind of his own household name, many other Swiss designers kind of using these principles. So I think what's sort of important here is that it's not really about one page layout, it's about how people experience the grid throughout the book. Um, so here the cover, um, 
you see the title on the cover is repeated in the same position on the title page. And then you also see that the text block on the first page um, is the same shape and placement as that green block of color. So that really that grid system is exposed from the cover all the way through. And those two columns uh, on the title page should be in alignment with that text block. Uh, here is a narrow text columns. This is for an exhibition catalog for uh, two sculptors. So their names are here on the cover. And then we see kind of repeated this very tall, thin um, text block. And I think when you're thinking about the sort of materiality of the page, you know, you can see in that middle image that you can see through the paper. So even though this page is pretty white, you can see that the type is in an alignment with the, with the text block that's printed on the other side of the paper. And that was, you know, not by accident. It was understood that that was perceived. This is a book that has two titles and you can start, you know, you can read it either way and they kind of join in the middle with um, a different type of paper stock. Uh, images that range across the spine and seeing like that sort of uh, horizon line or flow line, um, kind of organizing that, that spread in the middle. Here's another sort of flow line that moves across the cover um, into that title page and even sort of a, across where that image is placed. This is about someone's <coughs> travels through the desert. Uh, this is actually produced by a pharmaceutical company. Um, it's sort of a portfolio of um, cards or brochures about depression um, I think purple is supposed to somehow be like therapeutic in some way, but one of the ways in which Swiss design was actually sort of um, popularized or sort of spread to people beyond just graphic designers was actually things like these pharmaceutical brochures. They were, they were actually quite influential. Um, this is one of the brochures as well. So you can see it has that same kind of Swiss design um, approach. Um, this catalog on um, Joseph Albers, his sort of biographical information is on the left hand of the spreads and then the artwork is on the right. Um, some of the more famous examples of Swiss style are from Josef Müller Brockman. He literally wrote the book On the Grid um, that everyone will refer to. And I just found these examples of uh, his sketches using a grid and his posters. So I don't have a lot to say about these posters. I just wanted to kind of show them they're sort of the touchstone, I think, in a lot of people's minds for Swiss design. the grid at work in many forms. This was a, uh, I think this is a magazine he published. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about his use of the grid in books. So here again we see a cov the, the dust jacket, the cover, and the um, title page where the title has been you know, reproduced in the same place in all of them, sort of establishing that system. Uh, and this is a, a four by four grid, I'm, I'm guessing, in terms of where, how, you know, the, the type is not placed kind of randomly. 
it actually aligns with the grid lines. Um, this one I think is a three by four. And just thinking about content and material and design, you know, it's a book about film and the dust jacket is actually sort of a, a film or glassine that creates that um, kind of overlay effect. A uh, three by four grid. Oh, it looks like, <laughs> I don't know what I wrote there, but I'm not sure what grid this is, but it's, um, you know, at least dividing the page in two and then a full width. Uh, oh, and I think um, there's often text in multiple languages, so that kind of multi-column grid is, I think, common in Swiss design because uh, things were often published in multiple languages. So I want to just... Uh, get to some of the rules, which, you know, there are plenty of sort of books about these, and so I'll just sort of show a few spreads from the more famous ones. Um, this, uh, from the new typography by Jan Tischel, is sort of part manual, part manifesto, um, and he's really talking about economy, precision, and functionality, and you can see it's like very technical and specific. Uh, and then Josef Mueller Brockman, um, Grid Systems in Graphic Design. He is um, really kind of offering a, a theory and, um, and very specific examples of how to use the grid. And really, you know, the, the principles are directness, intelligibility, systemization, clarity, objective, objectivity, and rationality. Um, and that design decisions should be informed by some kind of logic. Um, so, I mean, in some of his examples here, just looking at um, page margins, uh, and I've kind of called out what he said so you can read it, you know, this first layout, he says, dull, the next one, functionally inadequate, I think because it's so low on the page, um, badly proportioned and well proportioned. So there's like a right way to do things and a wrong way here. Um, he's showing examples of symmetrical and asymmetrical layouts or text blocks. Um, you know, full of examples of thinking about different ways to um, lay out different columns from three and four columns all the way up to 12 columns. And mm -hmm. I have certainly sketched all these variations and more in my time of doing layouts. Um, sort of in practice, here's a 36 field grid. So you can see it can be used, you know, this is it in a more of a schematic way. And then over on the right, you can see that that 36 um, field grid could be used for a two column layout, um, for a four column grid on the right. Uh, the 20 field uh, grid can be used um, in a lot of different ways, you know, really to show, to surface a lot of smaller pieces of information or on the right, these kind of like larger and more expressive um, uses of the page or of the grid. Uh, sketches for a grid with 32 fields. This looks very familiar to me. I've filled notebooks with Similar things. So I mean, getting to be able to sketch these is its own art. Um, and it can be kind of deceiving. So it's easy to sketch things that look like they work in a sketch and don't always work when you kind of really try to put them into practice. But it's a good way to start. And think about all the different um, possible permutations. And then just some more practical examples of um, looking at a grid and how you might use it. Um, and then breaking the rules. 
uh, I pulled a, a few examples from um, Bright in the Corners. Um, they have done a bunch of uh, exhibition catalogs for Anish Kapoor, and so I thought um, it's kind of interesting to look at one artist's work in a few different books with different layouts. Um, so here, this has a much looser layout. I wouldn't say it's um, random in the sense of like a Dada collage, um, but it's looser. It, does, it still does maintain some um, sense of hierarchy and has some clarity about what it is. And we see an image all the way bleeding on the right and then placed another one placed across the spine. And then this kind of um, very non-traditional placement of text blocks, but really it kind of asks you to, to look at it in a new way. Um, here, I, the images, I think, seem to wrap around the page. So uh, you can see that this image on the right kind of continues on the next, um, you know, the image is sort of like too big for the page, but clearly that's constructed. You can make, you could make the image any size you wanted. Um, so this kind of just interesting ways of breaking the image across the page. Uh, this is a book that, um, was sort of in service of an uh, exhibition of Kapoor and um, Martin uh, Gropius Bau, <coughs> using this kind of like oil paint stain um, against this sort of classical uh, layout. <coughs> These are lists of the work titles. Um, here again, the image is sort of like too big for the page, but it's kind of masked by uh, this frame. So this is one image, but you see it in two pieces. It's sort of like each page almost has a cutout or feels like a, two viewfinders. Uh, this is a book that um, you can see in its slip cover. Here, you can kind of see that you can see a sculpture and then it, you can see another, oops, another view of it when you turn the page. So that notion of kind of different um, views of an object that actually is three-dimensional and lives in space. Uh, and then this layout, you know, this is a pretty traditional three-column grid here. And then on the right, we see um, this three by three grid that's placed sort of in an unusual way across the spine. And then another three by three grid that seems to even follow the grid less strictly. Um, but I think because uh, it does kind of map to this other, the images, um, it's the descriptions of the works, there is this relationship between these two things. And it's a little ambiguous, but it does seem to sort of live in space the image is kind of coming forward and the text kind of moving back. And obviously the sort of unusual um, color of the type um, also kind of adds to that. Uh, this is for an Anish Kapoor exhibition at the Gardens of Versailles. So you see this like very like tiny text block, well not tiny, but tiny in relation to the page and then these smaller images kind of floating in the margins. And then from the same book, these um, images also placed with these large margins and then bleeding up the, off the top of the page. And then in this book that they did, which is not for Anish Kapoor, <laughs> Uh, it's just a collection of photographs um, 
taken along a hike in the Pyrenees. So the placement on the page is a little more conceptual in the sense that it is um, meant to be at like, you know, what altitude it was taken at. So kind of going up and down uh, this um, rugged terrain. So you have a sense of that movement um, and you kind of understand where they are in space by just the placement of the photos. So that's it for me for the grid, but I did want to just um, kind of add, I guess, a few lessons, which I think I sort of touched on at the beginning. Um, but for me, as a controlling system, the grid makes it easier to give the surf surface or space, whether it's a page or um, components for a screen, some kind of rational organization. Um, it's a great exercise in defining um, hierarchy and sequencing. And really the questions I ask to be able to design content for a grid and to fit the content to the grid help to clarify the overall purpose of the project that I'm working on in general. Um, the grid is really a translation of systems thinking. And you know, if you're thinking about it from the sort of Swiss or modern perspective, modernist perspective, it's um, translating that into a practical human-centered design outcome. Uh, and of, again, it's really important for design for the web where there's really a tremendous lack of control in the sense of, you know, every, there's so many different operating systems, there's so many different browsers, there's so many different devices, there's different screen sizes, there's different screen resolutions. Um, so to have some kind of uh, very clear way to give order, despite all of those kind of inconsistencies, uh, is really important in the work I do. Um, and it's really an armature for ordering uh, a narrative. You know, a good story is memorable and shareable, um, but getting at what that story is takes some work. Um, so often when I'm working with um, businesses, the process of kind of designing for the grid, which is really tangible, can literally kind of get us all on the same page. And this is often the heaviest lift in, in um, the design phase of a project, like not speaking to um, development or coding. Um, once you can sort of establish some of that, those objectives or priorities or what the story is, you can kind of map all your design decisions to those um, objectives or that bigger story. So you can kind of act, once you know sort of what the overall strategy is, you can kind of act a little more tactically to re reach those goals. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>